My name is Valerie Shapiro. I'm co-president of the Canadian International Council Vancouver branch, along with my fellow co-president, co Paul Meyer, who's Paul Meyer, who's sitting right here. Our branch, in collaboration with the Royal United Services Institute Vancouver Society, also known as RUSI, are delighted to welcome you to hear an amazingly, amazing moderated panel discussion on the implications of the election outcome for Canada's foreign and defense policies. I'd like to start off by thanking Cam, where are you? Over there. To for thanking Cam for bringing his idea for this event to us and for the opportunity to co-host with RUSI. Cameron Cathcart is president of RUSI Vancouver Society. So the Canadian International Council, CIC, Canada's Foreign Relations Council, was actually founded in 1928 as the Canadian Institute of International Affairs. It's an independent member-based council with, over, with 15 branches across the country. It was established to strengthen Canada's role in global affairs and to promote dialogue and discussion of international affairs among Canadians. We have an amazing digital media platform, opencanada.org, that has excellent coverage of international affairs. I encourage anyone who's interested to check it out. Our branch, like the others, hold great events on current international issues, and both members and non-members are welcome. Of course, we want everybody to join CIC, as we are a member-driven organization, and rates are cheaper to come to lunches and events, and all welcome. Our next event is actually a member-only event with Gordon Longmuir, who sits on our executive and is former Canadian ambassador to Cambodia, and he'll be speaking about Southeast Asia. Now, the Royal United Services Institute, Vancouver Society, seeks to promote informed and balanced debate on strategic and national security issues by providing a forum for information and discussion within the community of the Greater Vancouver Area and Lower Fraser Valley. It's now my pleasure to introduce our panelists and then our moderator. Now, there is a change of one of our panelists this evening. Colonel retired Keith Maxwell will replace Dr. James Petillier, who is unable to participate in our panel discussion. Late last week, Dr. Petillier advised us that as special advisor to the Royal Canadian Navy, he is prevented from taking part in public discussions on foreign or defense matters during the federal election. And he say, sends his regrets. So I would like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Michael Byers, who is sitting on your extreme right, my extreme right. Michael holds the Canada Research Chair in Global Politics and International Law at the University of British Columbia. He's been a fellow of Jesus College, Oxford University, a professor of law at Duke University, and a visiting professor at the universities of Cape Town, Tel Aviv, Nordland in Norway, and how do I pronounce this, Michael? Novosibirsk. Novosibirsk in Russia. Yeah, Professor Byers is a regular contributor to the Globe and Mail and the National Post. His most recent book, International Law in the Arctic, won the 2013 Donner Prize for the Best Public Policy Book in Canada. Colonel retired Keith Maxwell, on my extreme left here, is a former senior executive, North American Treaty Organization of NATO in Brussels. His military career spans 41 years until retiring in 2009 from NATO in Brussels. From the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, he transferred to the Air Force, serving in a number of posts in NORAD, including Alaska. He flew as an AOAX mission commander for 15 years, directing the Air Defense Operations Center at NORAD headquarters in the Cheyenne Mountain facility in Colorado. In 1993, Colonel Maxwell was posted to the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, called SHAPE, in Mons, Belgium, as the Chief of Air Command and Control, later joining the NATO International Staff in Brussels. 
Colonel Maxwell remains active as an instructor and facilitator with the Capilano University Elder College program in Seashell. Lastly, and certainly not least, Ms. Jillian Sturk is a former Canadian ambassador and public service executive with more than 30 years experience in public policy, foreign affairs, international trade, and multinational negotiations. Until June 2013, Jillian was the Chief Foreign Policy Officer and Assistant Deputy Minister Strategic Policy, Global Issues, and European Affairs at the Department of Foreign Affairs, International Trade and Development. Jillian served as Canada's Ambassador to Norway from 2005 to 2009. Jillian is a Dialogue Associate at the Simon Fraser University Centre for Dialogue and a mentor with the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation where she is co-leading a project on diversity, pluralism, and the future of citizenship. She currently sits on the advisory board of the Allen Advisory Group, a global trade consulting firm, and she's also a member of the Board of Trustees of the West Vancouver Memorial Library. She volunteers with the Minerva Foundation for BC Women and with several other academic and community organizations. And now I would like to introduce this evening's moderator, Cameron Cathcart. Mr. Cathcart is a former broadcast journalist with a career spanning 40 years, including 30 years with the CBC as foreign correspondent in Washington, parliamentary reporter in Ottawa, national correspondent in Canada, executive producer and on-air presenter for the CBC radio and television networks. Following early retirement, Mr. Cathcart became an active volunteer. In July 2015, he was recognized by the City of Vancouver with the 2015 Civic Merit Award for his leadership of the annual Remembrance Day service at Victory Square, which has become one of the largest and most respected ceremonies of its kind in Canada. In 2012, he received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond, Diamond Jubilee Medal for dedicated service to his peers, the community, and to Canada. And in 2009, he was awarded the prestigious Minister of Veteran Affairs Commendation for Promoting Awareness of Veterans Issues in Canada. So I would like to invite Mr. Cameron to come to the mic and start the debate. I was going to say start the debate. Start the battle. No debate, I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. So nice to have those kind words. <laughs> and welcome, everybody. Uh, Royal United Services Institute in Vancouver is very, very pleased to be partnering for the first time with the Vancouver branch of the CIC in tonight's presentation. Uh, our timing is very good because, by happy coincidence, the leaders' debate on foreign policy uh, concluded less than an hour ago, and many of you in this room were watching it. Now, the difference between that debate and our presentation is that our discussion will be nonpartisan. When our guests present their views on how the outcome of the October 19th election may affect Canada's foreign affairs and defense policies in the future. Foreign affairs and defense policy often get very little attention, little traction, as they say, during the Canadian elections. But with three weeks left before the election, we are confident that you, here in this room, will be engaged on the subject emerging from this evening's discussion. Now, here is the format for tonight's presentation. We begin by inviting each panelist to comment on what transpired during the televised leaders' debate on foreign policy. Then, a series of agreed-upon questions will be directed to a specific member of the panel. After their response, the remaining two panelists will be invited to add further comment if they wish. And when all the questions have been answered and time permits, you and the audience will be invited to direct questions to the panel members. Them's are the rules, and that's what we're going to do. So, let us begin. First of all, Jillian Stern. Now, would you please take the lead with your perspective on the leader's debate that has just concluded. 
Thank you very much. Is the microphone working? Everything seems I to be working. I think yours good. is. Mine isn't. Good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening, and, and it's just wonderful to see so many people out uh, here to uh, listen to the, the debate and to, for the conversation uh, that follows. Uh, too often, I think, foreign affairs uh, gets uh, kind of lost um, in the electoral, pre electoral period. And uh, I think there's maybe a. Yeah, I'm just. Yeah. Just sure. leave, just okay. there, that's um, uh, too often it gets lost in the in the shuffle in the pre-electoral period and uh, for the first time in many years I think we've seen a lot more debate uh, in the public and in the press uh, in in the lead up to this election I think in part uh, because of some of the events uh, going on around the world um, foreign policy to me is the face that we show to the world um, it says something about who we are um, and uh, our values and our vision for the future some of you may have heard uh, Jana Stein uh, in an interview recently where, when she talks about being uh, in a moment of a dramatic transition where governance um, and uh, political, economic, social order uh, is in flux. Uh, and I, I think that's very much true. Power and influence are, are shifting um, from, uh, from west to east, um, from north to south, whether you measure economic growth, population, or uh, ideas. Uh, new powers are, are emerging and uh, the old institutions are under pressure to change. Listening to the debate tonight, uh, the three uh, political parties and their leaders present very different views of the world and uh, of Canada's role. Uh, the Conservatives, Stephen Harper's Conservatives, see the world as a dangerous place. Uh, they divide it into uh, friend and foe. Uh, so it's probably not surprising then that they tend to focus on traditional security military deployments, uh, defense, counter-terrorism. They also uh, put a high priority on economic issues, uh, negotiating free trade agreements and uh, promoting trade and investment. Uh, but from what I heard tonight, uh, there is still limited uh, interest in uh, contributing to global well-being. They find the give and take of traditional diplomacy distasteful, in fact. Um, the NDP uh, position is, is more complex. Uh, their platform talks about solidarity with the people, uh, especially with the, the poor and the powerless. Human rights are a central value, uh, and peace building uh, is a top priority. Uh, Thomas Mulcair has promised to end the military operations in Iraq and Syria, and to increase uh, the intake of refugees and augment uh, Canada's development assistance to 07 of GDP. Um, the challenge for an NDP government will be to develop a plan and the policies uh, to deal with a recalcitrant Russia, to address the inherent contradictions in building relations with China, a subject, by the way, we heard very little about uh, this afternoon, um, and balance uh, development assistance uh, with security concerns, all while respecting their commitment to balance the budget. Um, the Liberals, uh, I think, have traditionally put foreign policy uh, at the top of the agenda, although their platform, too, uh, lacks some specifics. Uh, they say that they will restore Canada's uh, international credibility, re-engage with multilateral institutions such as NATO and the United Nations, and pursue their, uh, their goals through um, diplomatic means rather than ramped up rhetoric. Um, Justin Trudeau's speech earlier this year on Canada-US uh, relations shows that the Liberals understand the complexity and the importance of that relationship. And again, we heard uh, quite a bit about that uh, this evening um, and that they have committed to uh, turning their attention to getting uh, that back on track. Uh, I think um, both the Liberals and the NDP recognize uh, that the access and the ties that we have uh, to the U.S. are not just important for bilateral relations, but also uh, for our broader influence uh, around the world. Um, the liberal approach to the Syria crisis balances uh, political, military, and the humanitarian objectives, um, and they have said that they will move quickly on uh, the refugee crisis, raising the numbers of uh, intake to 25,000. Um, on uh, C-51, uh, they, uh, I think, took a, a kind of a middle-of-the-road approach, arguing that it's important to protect both security uh, and uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms. But all three parties will face some of the same challenges in advancing foreign policy priorities in a shifting and volatile environment. All three will need to balance domestic political realities 
with foreign policy priorities and find the dollars uh, to support their policy goals. We live in a very competitive uh, international environment and Canada no longer uh, has the kind of influence that we once did. Uh, we need to learn to work better uh, with governments uh, in new and uh, emerging regional uh, powers, powers like India, Brazil, Turkey, and our continental partner, uh, Mexico, if we want to help us shape the world and advance our interests. Uh, going it alone is just not an option. Um, just uh, like some concluding okay. comments, okay, if, yes, if I may, I'll, I'll try to yeah. keep this quick. Yeah. Whichever party forms the government um, after October 19th, as I said, will face real challenges <laughs> in advancing Canada's interests at a time of limited resources and where competition for influence is growing. So if I were to offer any advice to a government, I would say we need to be um, innovative and nimble, not rigid and ideological. Uh, we need to define our priorities, but accept that as a G7 nation, and one that is uh, entirely dependent on, on trade, our interests and responsibilities are uh, global in nature. Uh, we need to know, devote more resources to diplomacy, development, and defense, and to use all three of these tools in support of one another. And last of all, to above all, remember that engagement without investment um, is just empty rhetoric. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jillian. Now I'd like to uh, turn to you, Michael. Uh, Michael Byers, what's your reaction to the foreign policy debate among the three leaders today? Well, first of all, it's it's wonderful to to be here and to to be here with such a distinguished moderator and <laughs> two uh, very distinguished co-panelists. Um, I agree with most of what's already been said. Um, I, I I do want to add a, a couple of things. Um, I think it's important to recognize that. Uh, one of the uh, three debaters this evening has a record uh, that stretches back nine years. Um, the other two are putting forward platforms, um, but Mr. Harper, to a significant degree, has to. Uh, hang on, are we okay here? Just, just there we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. I'll just sit up perfectly straight. <laughs> um, Mr. Harper has a record which he's having to defend. And uh, his record on, on foreign policy uh, is, I would suggest, relatively weak given the time that he's been in office compared to some of his predecessors, like, for instance, Brian Mulroney or, or Pierre Trudeau. Um, the other uh, two men who were uh, in the debate this evening um, are, are able both to criticize and, and also to, to look forward and to uh, sketch out a, a vision of where they would take the country. And their vision, their two visions are surprisingly or perhaps not so surprisingly, quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Harper uh, is uh, in international relations language, a, uh, uh, a realist, someone who believes in hard power, who uh, doesn't uh, think that there's such a thing as trust between uh, countries, um, that doesn't believe in, in persuasion, uh, the soft power and diplomacy that uh, is the currency of, of diplomats. Um, that's a, a influential worldview, uh, especially in countries like the United States and Russia and China, dare I say. A little bit less usual in a relatively small country like Canada. Um, the other two, uh, I think the the really big difference uh, that, that jumps out in, at me is uh, Tom Mulcair's uh, very significant personal and policy commitment to climate change. Um, and he has actually uh, said both in the French language debate and, and previously that if he is prime minister that he will go to Paris and recommit Canada to our Kyoto Protocol commitments. Now that's huge. I mean that is, is truly monumental. Um, and it will cost money because we are so far over <laughs> those targets right now. Um, and yesterday he introduced uh, a plan for a uh, cap and trade program which uh, follows very shortly after China's announcement that it will be taking a, a similar approach. Uh, Mr. Trudeau hasn't shown the, the same forward leaning uh, uh, approach to, to climate change. Of course, he uh, supports Keystone XL. Uh, I think that's the, the critical difference. Uh, but I was enormously impressed with Mr. Trudeau this evening. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a quick study and he uh, stood his ground well and he went after the Prime Minister. Um, I think it's also important to realize in closing that uh, we know that uh, 
the Liberals and the NDP will not cooperate with the Conservatives after October 19th. But there's a very real possibility that the Liberals and the NDP will have to work together. And it's nice to see so much uh, uh, closeness in their um, view of where Canada should be in the world. Thank you, Michael. Um, now I'd like to turn to Keith. Keith Maxwell, uh, what, what impressions do you come away with from today's uh, leaders' debate? Thanks. Is my mic working? I was enormously disappointed that there was no discussion in Nick Hobbs' face covering. <laughs> I, I love the extemporaneous debate style. I think that, that they got away from their talking points. I think that was very good. A significant improvement over things that we've seen before. I was particularly impressed with the moderator, and I think that he had a lot to do with that. He, he did a very good job. I certainly didn't think there was any knockout blow, but certainly the best line of the night was uh, was about the Arctic and big sled and no dogs. <laughs> I would add to that, when it comes to defense, he's also big hat and no cattle. Um, I, I think all three of them uh, took some hits in, in the right places where they where they deserved the hits. Uh, Harper certainly on the environment. Um, you know, greenhouse gas emission policy in this country has gone, has gone nowhere in, in 20 years. Uh, the Liberals are a little further detached from it, but they didn't do anything either except naming environmental minister's dog, Kyoto. Um, and uh, it, it, would, it would be good to see something change in that regard. Um, I think Mulcair was vulnerable on trade and protectionism, and I think that was, uh, it was good for that to be brought out. And Trudeau, giving the perception upon occasion of being on both sides of a number of issues, and, uh, and we saw all of that. What we didn't see is they all should have taken hits on defense. Um, we are... One of the laggards in, in NATO, um, defense funding has been, has been terrible. Uh, we're, we're suffering in that area very much. And there is a certain credibility of having a credible military, and, uh, and we're suffering in that. Uh, but all in all, I think it was a, it was a good, good debate. It was, it was interesting to watch. It brought out the differences between the, the three leaders. Uh, and I think there was a fair bit of light. There was a, a little bit of heat, uh, but I don't think it changed anything in the, in the polls. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, panelists. Uh, the point about uh, no reference at all to China was an interesting one, wasn't it? But we're going to deal with that tonight, so we'll be okay. Can you hear this uh, microphone? I have a feeling. Uh, okay. Are, are we all right? I think I'll take, take that with it. Okay. Um, okay. So I think what we'll now start to do, as I mentioned a moment ago, we're going to start with the questions. and. Uh, uh, Jillian, the first question goes to you, and it is this. In regard to the lengthy civil war in Syria and its effects on the population there, what specific policies should the next government pursue with respect to the exodus of migrants and refugees? You have uh, whatever time it takes, and then we'll see whether other people want to get involved. Okay? Okay. Well, let, uh, let me start by saying it, that in terms of uh, policy, not just of Canada, but I think of, of a number of nations, um, it's really been too little, too late uh, all the way along. Um, and that whatever we do in the region has to be part of a comprehensive strategy that has both a, a diplomatic or a political dimension, uh, a defense component, and of course, uh, a humanitarian uh, element. I think that might Mic working? Yes. Okay. Turn the mics off. Yeah, but people at the back cannot hear, so that's why we have the mics. Sorry. <laughs> um, the reality is, though, I, I think oh, for better. Canada, is that as it stands, we actually have very little influence uh, in the region. There are a number of uh, factors or reasons for that. Um, not least is some of the policies that I think we've, we've taken towards the region over the last uh, over the last 10 years. Um, that said, I think there are a number of uh, important things that we can do. Uh, you asked me to focus largely on the humanitarian piece, but I'm also going to touch briefly on, sure. on the, the defense uh, component, yeah. uh, because I think that uh, it's probably, it's not realistic uh, to deal with um, the crisis there and to deal with, uh, with ISIS without considering some kind of um, uh, military operation. Uh, what the nature of Canada's involvement uh, should be there, I think, is, is open for question. For me, what's very important is that you have a credible legal basis. Um, and it's clear that we don't have that in Syria. Uh, Iraq is another, another matter. Um, and uh, personally, I, 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 I'm sympathetic to the view that there's quite a lot Canada can be doing in the area of, uh, of training, uh, military support, military advice without necessarily being front and center in a bombing campaign. 
Um, on the humanitarian front, uh, again, I think there's much more that, uh, that Canada can be doing. We have traditionally been a, a leader in this area. We have a lot of experience uh, both in um, uh, managing refugee uh, flows abroad and um, integrating uh, new arrivals into, uh, into Canada. Um, I think we could be showing leadership uh, along with some of our other G7 partners uh, on this issue, um, offering uh, Canadian expertise and experience, and I think uh, we could certainly be doing much more in terms of uh, speeding up the process of you know, bringing uh, refugees to Canada. Uh, I heard uh, Stephen Harper say a number of times, uh, to quote him, genuine refugees, and it's clear in his mind that um, uh, the bulk of, uh, of these uh, migrants are not uh, what he would consider uh, legitimate uh, refugees. I think many Canadians feel quite differently and I think the facts on the ground um, suggest something rather different as, uh, as well. Um, and so I, I would certainly be in favour of us pushing uh, more uh, visa officers out to the field, uh, ramping up our uh, ability to uh, you know, look at uh, essential security considerations and move people uh, into uh, Canada to, um, with the support of uh, Canadian NGOs who have demonstrated that they're more than willing to step up to the plate on this. But last of all, I would say that you know this is this is just one crisis of many, and that um, what we really need to be thinking about is a long-term integrated approach uh, to the challenges of migration. This is not something Canada is going to be dealing with alone. We need to work with our partners on this, and we should. Uh, put in place the kinds of policies and processes so that we don't have to um, start from square one each time uh, we face a, another emerging crisis. On that last point, particularly, Michael, do you have uh, some res response to, to Julian's response? Uh, absolutely. I, uh, I'm very frustrated by uh, all, the, uh, all the talk that uh, isn't followed by immediate action. Um, Rick Hillier, the now retired chief of the defense staff, said, you know, this is not a logistical problem we can't overcome. And he suggested that we could move 50,000 of these people to Canada by Christmas. We have five brand new C-17 strategic lift aircraft sitting on the tarmac at CFB Trenton right now that can fly all the way to Turkey or Jordan and pick up two or 300 people and bring them straight back. Um, we have the capacity to, to, to deal with this if the will is there. The other thing to, to say is that uh, this country was founded upon immigration and many of the people who came here were, were refugees of different kinds, uh, some of them from political religious uh, persecution, um, which is the Geneva Convention uh, definition of refugees. These people who are escaping from, from Syria into Turkey and Jordan and onwards uh, into Europe are incredible risk takers, right? Many of them are young, they're energetic, they, they're, 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 they're fighting for an opportunity to, 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 to live out a, a full life, to escape persecution. Uh, if you wanted to put all the ethical questions aside and just focus on an immigration opportunity, like I believe Angela Merkel has in Germany, Right, recognizing that we have a demographic time bomb of, of baby boomers who are retiring and not enough young, energetic workers in this country. Right, forget the temporary workers program. Let's take in tens of thousands of more refugees. And these people are self-selecting. We could not get a better cadre of people to come to this country. Keith, uh, would you like to comment uh, on, on what Jillian said and pick up a little bit on what, on what Michael has just said now about the capacity to bring people in? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on that, certainly. Um, our, our record with refugees coming into this country is, is marvelous. We've had some of the best people come into this country as refugees. 1956 with the Hungarians, 1968 with the, with the Czechs. There's a whole list of, of those, and, and those people have come in, and quite often they've been the elite of their group, as, as Michael had said. Uh, the capacity to bring them in, uh, whether it's C-17s or or uh, least Boeing 707 or 747s doesn't really matter. Uh, certainly, we have a we have a lot of room. We have a lot of capacity, and uh, and I think we're being a little bit remiss in that area. Bearing in mind that, in amongst that vast majority of, of genuine refugees, there are security problems, and we need to take those into account too. And the best way of doing that is in keeping them out. It's making sure that we provide proper resources to the proper intelligence and screening to make sure that that works. 
Okay, thank you very much. Now, moving right along, next we have a wide-ranging question from Michael, and it concerns Russia and its current behavior on the international scene. The question is this, Michael. What policies should be pursued by our next government in response to the heightened Russian assertiveness and aggression in Ukraine, Syria, most recently, as yesterday or earlier this week, and this is an area you have particular interest in, the Arctic. I've met Vladimir Putin. Um, I wouldn't turn my back on Vladimir Putin. <laughs> I sometimes say jokingly that he's a smaller, fitter, meaner version of Stephen Harper. <laughs> um, and then like Mr. Harper, he's a rational actor. Um, Putin is not an ideologue. He's not crazy. Uh, he has his own uh, framework of, of circumstances and, and his own background, his own frame of reference. But within that context, within that frame of reference, he is ruthlessly realist and calculated. Um, and that means we can actually work with him. We don't need to like him. We don't need to do any favors to him. We certainly don't need to trust him. But it is possible to have a relationship that can provide greater stability, avoid escalation, uh, and perhaps uh, find opportunities uh, for, uh, for, for, for cooperation in fields that are vital to, to both countries. Um, I, uh, I examined a uh, master's thesis today uh, where the, the, the student set out to actually uh, look at the Russian legal justifications for the annexation of Crimea, and that was a, a task that I thought was very important uh, to, to recognize that, that both sides have their own world view and, and the issue of, of Crimea, although one that, that clearly represents uh, a challenge to the international order, um, is not the kind of fundamental uh, break or, or challenge to authority that Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait was. Um, the significant majority of people in Crimea, no one would question, wanted to join Russia. Um, they wanted to do so against the will of their government in Kiev, but, but there, there are factors here that we need to, to understand. Elsewhere, um, the Russians are surprisingly willing to cooperate, and so too is the West. So for instance, uh, in April, Canada hosted the ministerial summit of the Arctic Council member states, um, and Russia was there with a cabinet level representation, not the foreign minister, the minister of natural resources uh, and the environment, but Russia was there. Canada, shortly after the annexation of Crimea, hosted the first meeting of the Arctic Economic Council and welcomed the vice president of Rosneft, Russia's immense uh, state-owned oil company, to Iqaluit, uh, Leona Agluluk, saying things against Russia in public, but cooperating with regards to Arctic economic cooperation. And I think that's totally appropriate. The fact of the matter is that the world is a very complex place. There are thousands and thousands of interdependencies between us. We have a problem with Russia in Eastern Europe that is uh, epitomized by its um, aggressive, destabilizing behavior in, in Ukraine. But we are not dealing with North Korea here. We're dealing with a country that is a member of the World Trade Organization, that sits on the UN Security Council, is trying to find some kind of solution to the crisis in Syria, is a partner in dealing with Iran, a partner in dealing with ISIS. Um, so what I would like to see in terms of, of Canadian policy on, uh, on Russia is that we don't demonize Russia. Uh, we don't uh, say, look, we can't work with these people. We don't play domestic politics with the situation. Um, but we, we recognize that we only were able to end the Cold War because we were willing to work with Russians. And, and we're not in the Cold War now, it's not nearly that bad, but the same kind of approach. Um, Ronald Reagan was able to meet with Mikhail Gorbachev. Stephen Harper should be able to meet with Vladimir Putin and not grandstand on the occasion. Thank you, Michael. What I'm getting here, uh, Michael, uh, from you, and I'd like to pose this question to, to for your response on that, uh, Keith, is it seems like Michael wants to see the next government develop a rapprochement with, uh, with Russia, if I can put it that way. What, how do you feel? 
Well, I, I think he, Michael's made a good point. Back in the Cold War, we actually talked to the Russians. We, we had a dialogue, we had a discussion, we had a number of agreements. Uh, we had a set of rules about, about how we intercepted each other in the, in the Arctic and, and the, North, uh, the North Atlantic. Um, we need to have similar kinds of dialogue and, and, and agreements with them, not just in the military sphere, but in, in the diplomatic sphere and, and how we deal with each other. And I think that's a, that's a good idea. Dialogue is, is never wasted. I'm, uh, I'm opposed to cutting off dialogue. Uh, I think uh, grandstanding isn't a good idea either. Um, but we need to stand our ground and, and, uh, and know our positions and know them well and make sure that, uh, that, they're, that they're understood and that they're coordinated well with our allies. Jillian, do you have any response to this at all? Or? Uh, well, just to say that um, I would agree that I don't think this kind of wrapped up rhetoric is, is very effective. So not it certainly so, so something you'd want the next government no, to do. No, I mean, it certainly doesn't uh, worry the Russians one way or the other. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and at the same time, I think it actually undermines our ability to play a constructive role on, on Ukraine. Uh, we certainly provided some assistance to the Ukrainians. This is, this is good. It's as it should be. And of course, we, we should support Ukraine. But at the same time, I think if, if we um, had a better working relationship with the Russians, if we could, you know, deal with them from a, a, a more uh, res in a more respectful uh, diplomatic type of way, uh, we might not actually be excluding ourselves from uh, playing some kind of a, a mediating role. Um, the reality on Ukraine is that, like it or not, uh, the Ukrainians are going to have to come to some kind of uh, agreement with. The Russians around a whole range of issues, not just about borders, but uh, on economic issues, on energy issues, and um, the reality is they are their closest and very large neighbor. And I don't think we should be trying to provoke um, the Ukrainians into, um, you know, uh, actions that um, are not necessarily in their long-term interest. Okay, thank you. We have to move right along now, and now I'm going to turn to Keith and talk about. Uh, Canada's military in an in unpredictable and, and potentially dangerous world. The question I have for you, Keith, is this. What is the most suitable role the next government should take for the Canadian military to play in the nation's foreign policy, and how should it best be equipped to carry this out? Thanks. I'm glad we're talking about this because it certainly wasn't discussed in the debate. Um, in an uncertain, unstable, and potentially dangerous world in some, in some ways, it's, it's pretty hard to see any party departing from the current uh, strategic documents that, that govern the Canadian forces right now, and that is the Canada First Defence uh, Strategy, CFDS. Uh, that's the strategy that was published after major operations were finished in Afghanistan and provides a very general uh, guidance for a multi-purpose uh, uh, force to be, to, be, uh, uh, to be able to carry out Canada's commitments. There are a number of missions and there are a number of capabilities. The missions are pretty obvious. Disaster relief, uh, normal contingency and peacetime operations like NORAD in the air defense role and patrolling in the Arctic, but also things like being able to, to put a contingency operation overseas for, for an extended period of time, a small one, and a larger one to lead it for, for a limited period of time. And those are, uh, those are the normal kinds of tasks uh, that they would get. In terms of capabilities, Canadian forces have been tasked to maintain, for instance, a wide range of capabilities from peacekeeping to mechanized maneuver warfare on land, uh, tactical air-to-air -air and air-to-ground operation, fighter operations, a significant airlift capability, a maritime air and surveillance uh, capability, air search and rescue, and also a blue water navy capability for anti-air, anti-surface, and anti-submarine warfare. Uh, and the aspirational manning level for that is 70,000 people, including, in addition, uh, reinforced by about 30,000 reserves for a total of 100,000. And they have to do all of that this year with a budget that amounts to less than 1% of the GDP. That's the lowest budget level since 1938. The NATO goal for defense spending uh, that Canada agreed to last year is 2% of GDP. And we're not even up to half of that. We sit at the bottom of the resourcing list with our fellow NATO Freeloaders like Hungary and Luxembourg. Um, the mission and the resourcing don't match up. And that's a pretty sad state, particularly as we're getting into some pretty serious delays in procurement. Uh, and as those delay, they become more expensive. And those are the F-18 F replacement, um, the, uh, the provision of Arctic patrol vessels, uh, and those numbers are debatable, certainly the supply ships, and to replace our 15 
uh, major surface combatants, mainly frigates, but three destroyers. Uh, and I, you know, the, the documents that have been published so far tend to indicate that, that there's a fair bit of similarity in the defense policy of, of the liberals and, and, the, uh, and the conservatives, and we're not hearing much from the NDP at all in that area. Um, but the major capital pro programs are the right ones, but the devil's in the details, of course. Which fighter? How much does it cost? Should it or should it not include the F-35? I, I would like to include the F-35 in the consideration just because I want to know what the market price of an F-35 is <laughs> as opposed to the sole source price. And I suspect they're significantly different, but I'd like to get into that. Um, but the, uh, we, we'd, we'd like to see that. There, there, there is more expensive procurement looming on the horizon, certainly the, the Aurora CP-140 maritime surveillance and, uh, and patrol aircraft is, is going to have to be replaced. Uh, and all of that is stretching the capability uh, shortfall in the, in the Canadian Forces Defence Strategy. For example, this year the budget is $3.5 billion short of the original plan profile when that document with funding and resourcing was published in 2008. They never even got to the first year with, uh, with the funding, by the way. Um, and we now are at the point of hollow out where we have some components of the force that cannot carry out their mission. We have no support and supply ships anymore. Uh, the, the Chilean Navy is going to be brought in to, to, to assist Canada and, and keep them uh, going in, uh, in terms of blue water capability. And that's only until we can get an ad hoc interim arrangement to take us up to the point of procurement. Uh, I think that's a fairly serious uh, indictment. The real policy challenge then is financial. In March of this year, the Parliamentary Budget Office issued figures showing that Canada over the next 10 years is uh, looking at a shortfall of somewhere between 33 and 42 billion dollars over that 10 year profile just to meet the very unambitious Canada First Defence Strategy goals and, and for sustainability. And I would suggest it's going to be on the high side of that, not the low side because uh, of the delays in procurement and, and natural escalation. Um, in order to meet our, nat our, our obligations and ensure a viable force, any new government should create a stable funding profile um, that is protected and looked after uh, and not used as a, as a source to, to hit upon every time there's a temporary um, shortage somewhere else. Well, the defense can wait another couple of years for their toys. Let's take an another billion from them. They've done that consistently and it's turning into, into rust out and hollow out. If a government doesn't have the political will, they should have at least the, the political honesty to, to cut the mission and cut the force um, at the same time as they're cutting the, the funding to avoid the kind of hollow out that I'm, that I'm talking about. But as a wealthy G, G7 nation with uh, worldwide interests and, and economic interests and security interests, I think Canada needs to maintain a, a capable general purpose force uh, that can match up with the alliances, look after our national interest, can contribute meaningfully uh, in, a, in any one of those kinds of operations. And I think to, to do other, otherwise borders on negligence, we're bordering on negligence now. Thank you. Well, uh, just we're sitting in the, the largest uh, seawater, uh, blue water port in Canada, and the profile of the Navy in this town is pretty minimal. I know that, I, uh, that's just a comment, by the way, <laughs> um, perhaps an editorial one. Uh, Michael, I want you to, to speak to what, uh, to what Keith has said, and I'd like you to address uh, the notion that how the next government has to have the will as well as the dedication in terms of uh, dedicating the kind of money that we need to, to use. There are, only a, there are only a couple issues of public policy that actually make me angry. And, and the Harper government's um, neglect of the Canadian Armed Forces makes me angry. Um, it, it's partly the, the issue of, of not replacing essential equipment so that our men and women have to go to sea or into the air or on the land with unsafe equipment, with equipment that does not enable them to actually be professional, carry out their missions. And they're all professionals too. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, we can't deploy the army abroad in any kind of numbers today because most of the armored trucks are no, no longer functional. There's a, a much delayed procurement of 1,300 armored trucks that just doesn't seem to go anywhere. The, the Navy uh, is, is in desperate strait. The, the Air Force, um, you know, the, the search and rescue plans in this country are older than I am. 
Uh, and I can tell you, I'm falling apart. Just, just imagine about those planes. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. And it's, it's about the safety of our air crews. It's about the safety of our sailors and our soldiers. It's about our respect for them. And then you add to that the treatment of our veterans mm -hmm. or the victims of PTSD. And there are lots of victims of PTSD. And this government didn't recognize that for many, many years. So the next government coming in. So the in, next government. How are they going to deal with that? Well, the first thing to say is that a liberal or NDP government doesn't matter which, is going to have to raise defense spending. Yeah, okay? absolutely. I mean, I told this to Jack Harris, who would be the next NDP defense minister, and he gets it, right? Because so little money has been spent, and there's so much that needs to be done, right? So maybe we only go up to 1.2%, right, which is still below most of our sort of middle power allies. But you could do something to deal with these crises, at least with that. Um, and then you, you said the NDP hasn't been talking much about defense. Well. Tom Mulcair was very clear, he wants a full competition for the CF-18 replacements, not excluding any plane because he wants them all to have a chance to compete. Um, you know, he wants to have new search and rescue. He wants to have new trucks. He wants to have new uh, supply ships, right? There are certain issues uh, where I'm sure there are differences, but, but both the opposition parties quite clearly want to have a competent, multitask military where the personnel are treated properly and given the equipment they need. There's no question about that. And, and ironically, the, the man who wrapped himself in the flag of Afghanistan, Stephen Harper, right, mm -hmm. who made the military his brand, has tarnished it beyond yeah. belief. And again, I'm angry about this. I don't get angry about anything except for climate change and the military. I can tell you're a little angry. Yeah. We, I think we can appreciate that. <laughs> I think we'll move on, though. Jillian, I want to ask you the next question because uh, time is moving on. We, I'd like to go into the, the timely subject of climate change, picking up on what Michael has just said. Uh, a major UN climate change conference will be held in Paris this December. We heard about that today in the, in the debate. What policy positions should the Canadian delegation be taking at this meeting? Well, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to wade in here, given that I know there are a number of experts on this subject in the audience, but nonetheless, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, Give it I'll a shot. Do, my, yeah, do my best. <laughs> um, I think the first thing to note is that the climate change uh, conference will open um, in the first week of, uh, of December, or in fact, 30th of November. So microphone. just... Microphone. Yep. So just... Uh, I think we've lost it. Excuse me. I can just stand up. We can live without it, but we can't live with it. There we go. You're John Zach. That was the transmitter. Why don't I just stand up and sure. try and speak yeah. loudly? Um, try to get my voice to carry into that. Um, just to say that the, the climate change o conference will open about six weeks um, after the federal election. And so I think the reality is the best that, that one could hope from uh, hope for uh, from, from any of the parties would be kind of a, a, ch a signal of a change of direction uh, and a change in tone. Uh, I don't think it would be realistic to see anyone going with, you know, sort of fully formed uh, new uh, new policies in what is a, is a very complex uh, complex area. Um, the, I think the other point to note as well is that while climate change is certainly a foreign policy issue, it is also very much a, a domestic policy issue. And as I think, as uh, perhaps it was uh, Tom Melker made the point tonight, it's also uh, an, uh, an economic uh, issue. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, uh, I, I would think the very first thing uh, that that any government would need to do would be to consult with the provinces. And uh, it, it would seem to me that, um, you know, the, when you look at the, the issues of climate change, energy, uh, environment writ large, what you're looking for is leadership from the federal government. You want a, a clear sense of direction uh, and some a policy framework. But the reality is that uh, a lot of the results are going to have to be delivered by provinces, by municipal governance and by the private sector. Uh, and so nobody's going to be able to, to move uh, alone on this. Um, if you ask me what I think some of the, the key elements might be uh, that, that, a, that a new government could move on, certainly the first uh, issue would be putting the price on carbon. 
And whether that's a carbon tax like we have here in, in British Columbia or a cap and trade system that we see in the other provinces, uh, I, I think this is going to have to be something that there's going to have to be a certain amount of differentiation uh, across the, the country. But what's important is, is going to be uh, the results of putting a price on carbon. Even the public or even the private sector uh, acknowledges that this is the way that we're going to have to go. And in fact, many of the, uh, the, the companies are actually ahead of, uh, ahead of governments on this one. Second area I would, I would focus on would be tightening up uh, the environmental regulation. And I come at this as a little bit with the perspective of someone who uh, lived in Norway for four years, a country which is also very much dependent on the fossil fuel industry, on oil and gas. And yet they have managed to develop their oil industry and their gas industry with the highest environmental standards, the lowest possible emissions, uh, and very tight um, uh, regulation, all, all at the same time while putting away uh, funds for the future. Um, they've also invested, of course, in, uh, in green energy and in a number of different sources of renewable energy, and uh, which would be a third area that I, I would recommend that any government look at here in Canada, um, is looking at how uh, you can uh, address you know, some of the, the new opportunities that are out there uh, at the same time as um, looking at the way in which we manage um, our, our oil and gas industry, which is likely to be an important part of the economy uh, for, for years, to, years to come. Um, and I think perhaps the, the last point I would make would be investment in uh, infrastructure. I think it was Justin Trudeau that raised that point tonight. Um, and that's really about you know, building the kind of cities of the, of the future um, and tackling uh, both the demand side uh, as well as the supply side uh, when we look at the uh, at fossil fuels. So I think um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Okay, I'll invite comment from either you, Keith, or I'm, Mike. Pretty thorough answer, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy with that. I, yeah. I, the only thing I would add is that uh, um, I, 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 for six years now, I've led a, a project called the Climate Justice Project, uh, which is a big 1.5 million dollar research project on on climate policy related to to issues of social justice social policy economic policy and the one thing that comes through on, on all of the analysis is uh, that oil and gas is the most capital intensive industry that we have in this country therefore it creates the fewest jobs per dollar and things like energy retrofitting houses creates the most jobs per dollar mm -hmm. So this idea that, that, the, that, that, that the economy and the environment are somehow in, in competition with each other is completely false. If we got serious about the environment, we'd actually stimulate the economy in, in, in quite significant ways. Right. Um, and, and I think the Prime Minister has been uh, misleading Canadians about this for a long time. Okay, we're going to jump now uh, to another question because uh, the time is moving on and I know that both you, Michael, and Keith uh, have to leave fairly quickly at, mm -hmm. uh, after 7.30. Uh, I'd like now, and th this is to you, Michael, it's regarding international trade and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, Canada's been negotiating the TPP uh, agreement with several Asia-Pacific states. How do you see the next government, not the current one, the next government carrying this work forward and how would ratification of the TPP affect Canada in its trade and diplomatic relations with China. There was a, a staggering moment in the economic debate, the one hosted by the Globe and Mail, where the Prime Minister um, said that we needed the TPP so badly that, that we'd have to join it, <laughs> regardless. Well, which is a bizarre thing for someone to do in the course of a negotiation, before the <laughs> final negotiations <laughs> have taken place. Particularly when um, you know, we're contesting with the United States and Japan over the, uh, the domestic content requirements for automobile parts, when there's a really big issue of dairy producers and supply management. There, there's, there's stuff on the table right now that's still important, and the Prime Minister conceded it. And I'm pretty sure the State Department has someone watching CPAC during these debates. Oh, you think? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, 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 the conclusion I take from this is that Stephen Harper is a lousy trade negotiator. Yeah. Uh, it, it just, there's no other conclusion possible. Um, I, I, I suspect that uh, that both opposition parties would do a better job in terms of, of actually, uh, you know, keeping their cards close to their chest and 
and, and, and actually, you know, being firm on certain issues. And raise the level of the negotiation, uh, are you and, saying? Yeah, or and, and, and I'll just give you one, one example. The United States wants to deliver NAFTA as part of the TPP. It needs Mexico and, and Canada to, to go along. That's pretty crucial. Right. We, we haven't been cultivating a good relationship with Mexico, so we can't collectively bargain mm -hmm. with Mexico vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And, right. I mean, the United States has a has us exactly where it wants us as supplicants in this process. Mm -hmm. Now, your question is what does the next government do yes. if, if the TPP is signed and it has to choose whether or not to ratify? And I think the simple answer there is I can't give you an answer until I read the text. Just yeah. like I can't give you an answer Perfect. on the comprehensive European trade agreement until I actually can read the text. Yeah. And you know, Mr. Harper brags a lot about trade agreements that, that, that no one's had a chance to study. Yeah. And the devil's in the detail. There's no such thing as a, a perfect, pure, free trade agreement no. because you wouldn't need to negotiate if you just were getting rid of all barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the reason you negotiate is because it's a question of which barriers you keep and which you get, get rid of. And, and, and so the, the detail is important. Um, but you know, um, maybe we can move forward with a, a government that, that actually uh, you know, just doesn't want to sign up to anything. Right. Before, before the negotiations. <laughs> Jillian, could you, do you want to in, well, have I'm your input in this? I'll jump in on, it, yeah. not so much on the negotiation of the TPP, but on the broader relationship uh, with, with Asia. And I think part of your question was, if indeed we were to conclude the TPP, what does this mean for our economic relations with China? China exactly. And I would just say that it, in some respects, I think it raises the bar a little bit mm -hmm. uh, in terms of economic uh, cooperation in Asia writ large. Um, and uh, that, I think, will be a good thing for both in terms for, for Canada, but also perhaps will give us perhaps a little more leverage in terms of, of our relationship with China. And, and we'll certainly put pressure on the Chinese in terms of some of their standards so that are uh, around economic activity, whether it's intellectual property or investment regulations and, and so on. Um, but the other point I wanted to make really is about developing a more mature relationship with China. And it's a little bit the same as a relationship with Russia. We have a number of common interests, probably more interests in some respects with, mm -hmm. with China going, going forward. But they're not an easy partner. We're going to have problems around uh, security in the, in the Pacific. We're going to have issues with respect to cyber security. But we have to learn how to manage those in the context of a broader relationship so that every time something happens, we don't have to start all over again mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and rebuild the relationship, except that we have interests and differences and we manage them in, in, a, in a, broader, uh, a broader sense. And same right. applies to Russia. Now, related to that, uh, Keith, I'd like to do a follow-up because it relates to what both of our earlier speakers have said. In light of Canada's economic shift toward the Pacific, what arrangements should Canada pursue to facilitate any multi uh, multilateral military operations that might take place in the West Pacific or East Asia? And I'm thinking, can we kind of clone NATO and make it a make it a Pacific NATO or something like that. You understand what I'm saying? I, I do. It's, yeah. uh, it's interesting. Um, you know, where, where our economic interests go, quite often our security and, and, uh, and defense interests go as well. Um, and when we look across the Atlantic, we have a very mature command and control and logistics arrangement uh, in, in NATO. It works very well and certainly every major operation we've been involved with in the last 15 years, or pretty much all of them, have had NATO in the lead in, in, in one sort or another, and it works pretty well. Looking the other way, we don't have any kind of similar arrangement. Um, but it's hard to imagine Canada getting involved in an operation in the West Pacific or in East Asia that doesn't involve the United States. And probably the United States has a, is gonna, gonna, going to provide the command and control arrangements for that. We just need to be prepared to fall into that command and control, those command and control arrangements, and we should have things like agreements in place liaison staff and be prepared to put some resources into that, staffing at the, at, the, at the operation centers, communications, providing our fairly significant intelligence assets into, into those information, into, into those, those command and control arrangements. Does that exist now? Do those plans exist today, do you think? They need, I, I think that the Canadian forces right now is so wrapped up in trying to keep their, their head above water that they're not doing that. Uh, and certainly not doing it nearly as, as robustly as, as they could have. And I had some Yep. Some significant dealings with, uh, yep. with, with the uh, U.S. Pacific Forces when I was in Alaska. And we need that kind of liaison, we need that kind of ongoing thing. We also need to do perhaps 
similar kinds of discussions with other friendly nations in the area, Australia, Philippines, South Korea, Japan, uh, just to make sure that we, we have an agreement and, and have some place where we have access to things like airports and ports, yeah. we have to deploy a force uh, and provide the logistics behind them. Uh, none of that costs very much. Uh, it's not like we'd be moving a lot of material or, or manpower or anything else. But to have those agreements in place before a crisis is a lot more, uh, it's a lot easier to do than trying to do that in the middle of a crisis. Yeah. And uh, I would certainly want to see that kind of a thing. Michael, would I'll you like to finish it? Yeah, one quick, quick thing. The next government of Canada is going to have to decide whether or not to replace the Victoria class submarines, which are now more than three decades old and barely functional. It's a big decision, Mr. Disagree. Harper. Disagree. Yeah. Mr. Mis 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 I, I was at MARPAC a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Mr. Harper doesn't want to talk about this because it involves something of an admission of failure in terms of the billions of dollars that have been put into these subs, but also the very, very big price tag that it is attached to to actually buying a new complement of submarines. Huge decision. It's not on the radar right now for good reasons, but watch this space in the course of the next five years. And that would tie in with what uh, Keith has talked about in terms of the uh, uh, Pacific? Uh, South Pacific? Uh, 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 absolutely. There are people who make good arguments uh, as to the importance of submarines and the ability to project force at sea. Right, yeah. Johnny, do you have any comment to make about any of no, You're okay? I'm okay. <laughs> now, um, we have only, uh, by my watch, we only have four minutes left. And I'm going to ask if there's any really, really quick question in this. Oh, see one over here and one here. And I want, I want to ask you to make sure that you ask the question very, very quickly. And don't make a speech. <laughs> Very good question. Uh, uh, Michael, it, would it, you make it, a brief response it's a, on that? It's a fabulous question. Um, a Liberal or an NDP government would want the military to be able to do some things, whether it's peacekeeping, humanitarian relief, counterinsurgency, participating in U.S. Uh, aircraft carrier groups. You want a military to do something if you're a government. And, uh, and certainly the Liberal uh, government of uh, Jean Chrétien let down the military, but that was in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War when we still had some functional equipment. The situation is much, much worse today. So I don't think that either a Liberal or an NDP government would have much choice if they wanted to participate in international affairs and do the kinds of things that, that would be part of the basic uh, uh, skill set of uh, uh, a mid-sized country. Uh, the other thing I'll say, just in respect to the NDP, um, is that uh, I know uh, certain uh, New Democrat MPs who are very wound up about the mistreatment of the working men and women of the Canadian forces. Um, it, it, you sometimes People sometimes forget that this is a working class military, yeah. and the NDP does connect at an emotional level with those 60 odd thousand people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Mr. McKenzie? Yeah, yeah. My question is the President of Russia. You stand up? Putin. Just uh, just stand up so we can see you. Uh, uh, right. My question is the President of Russia, Putin. I was extraordinarily interested in really short. <laughs> Michael's comments. Yeah. And it seems to me Syria is a Western disaster at the moment. A new government in Ottawa, how could they most effectively deal with Putin where something positive might happen in the Mideast? <laughs> Listen, if it wasn't for Russia's involvement, we wouldn't have a nuclear deal with Iran, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes if you're faced with an intractable problem, your enemy's enemy is your friend, right? Putin wants to get back into some kind of working relationship with the West. The sanctions are biting. The low price of oil is killing his economy. He wants to get back into to something that approaches cooperation, and, and Syria is a great opportunity for him to, to do that. Again, never trust him. Okay, he he kills his political opponents, right? Yeah. Don't forget that. 
right? If Mike Duffy was in Russia, Mike Duffy would be dead. Okay? So, so I, I, I'm, I am not an apologist for Vladimir Putin. I'm just saying that, that he needs us right now, and that means he could be a partner in Syria uh, to provide some kind of new stability to that desperate country. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's 729, and I said that uh, I promised both Keith and Michael that they'd be they could be leaving this uh, august company by 7.30. <laughs> so I think that we have no more questions. Thank you very much. Uh, but I really appreciate them all. Oh, and I'd like now to call upon, oh yes, uh, our, our good friend here, Robert, would like to take a picture of everyone from this position. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Yeah. Nice wide shot. <laughs> Smile. Smile, everybody. <laughs> or whatever. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Robert. I'd like to call upon Paul Meyer now, pre co president of uh, CIC. Well, thanks, uh, Cam. And uh, I think uh, I can say on behalf of all of us uh, that uh, who've been present to uh, two debates on foreign policy uh, this evening that the second one was far superior <laughs> <laughs> in all ways. Uh, I can only uh, really express a sincere thanks uh, to our uh, distinguished panelists, uh, Michael Byers, Julian Sturk, Keith Maxwell, uh, and our uh, incredibly um, gifted uh, moderator, uh, Cameron Cathcart, who I also should credit with the original idea of uh, bringing us uh, all together uh, with an event focused on foreign policy in light of the impending election recognizing that it is often uh, a theme uh, that gets uh, ignored or eclipsed uh, by uh, the uh, normal sort of cut and thrust and parry of uh, domestic uh, disputes. So uh, it's a reminder of how important uh, foreign policy is to Canada's sense of itself in the world and the contributions that we can make. And uh, if uh, Mr. Harper's policy in the Arctic is a case of uh, big sled and old dogs, uh, I think here this evening we had an example of a big theme and many insights. Um, and I would just uh, ask um, uh, you to join me in expression uh, of appreciation uh, for all those who contributed to making this uh, evening so productive. If I can uh, put in one, uh, this announcement, uh, we're, we're delighted with the collaboration between CIC Vancouver branch and the Rusi Vancouver Society, uh, and uh, there is an important upcoming annual meeting of the CIC Vancouver branch to be held this Thursday, October 1st, um, uh, starting at 5 p.m. It's going to be held in the offices of Miller Thompson Law Office at 840 Howe Street, very close to the law courts here.